Ruiz. Welcome back to the next part of this Truth and Rhythm episode. Be sure to subscribe to this channel. If you've already done so, please share it with friends. Also become a member by joining Truth and Rhythm on Patreon or consider donating at funkinstuff.net. Thank you so much for your interest and support. Enjoy. And during that period, Tom, I mean, that was sort of like a golden age uh, in a way of like sax uh, augmenting you know, rock and popular uh, tunes on the radio. Yes. Right. I mean, it was great. During, it was a great, yeah. it was a wonderful, wonderful time. I, my timing was inadvertent, but very, very spot on in a way. And um, you did the theme for Streets of San Francisco. Is that right? I, I played on it. Pat Patrick Williams wrote the theme, but I played the saxophone. You know, it goes... Da 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 da, and the sax 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 solo da 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 saxophone again. That that was me. The first two or three seasons, at least. Ah, great stuff. I mean, some some of those shows, like the Quinn Martin ones you mentioned, and I'm not sure if that was a Quinn Martin production or not. Uh, it was. Oh yeah, yeah. That was part of the Quinn Martin series series of the things that were on. Yes, Streets of San Francisco, a Quinn Martin production. There you go. It's all coming back now. Yeah. <laughs> um, but so many of those uh, uh, shows, their theme songs kicked butt, and a lot of them became hits. Um, right. You know, subsequently. Yep. Um, was there any time that you went into uh, a situation and it just was not working out, and you're just like, I got to pull the plug on this? And maybe you just bail well, on, a, on a project? Right. Well, the one thing that comes to mind is. Um, a producer who uh and this involves this involves whitney houston and i i do enjoy telling this story because i want to know i want people to know that uh i admired whitney houston a great deal for something she did i'll get to that in a minute um but but the producer this producer uh say his name michael masser it's easy enough to look up he, he was the songwriter and producer of whitney houston's first album he had got, made the deal with uh clive davis you know, Whitney Houston was this young, beautiful black singer with this amazing voice, and he was convinced that he could make her into a star. And of course, he was he was absolutely right. And uh, there was a tune on there, which when I first listened to it, it was sort of it, it sort of harkened back to the old fifties doo wop kind of thing. Do 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 that had kind of feel, you know, that old uh, twelve eight uh, shuffle kind of thing fine you know great so i played uh you know i just he said just just play where you feel which i did and then i did it again and then i did it again and again and again and by take 24 or something i stopped i put my hand up i says you know michael i don't have anything more to say if you've got all 24 of those tracks i know that, that my best work is on there somewhere. And it's quite frankly, it's probably somewhere on the first two. <laughs> I said, I'm done. I, I, I'm sorry. I, I quit. You know, I've given you everything I could possibly give you that you could use. And I, this is pointless. This is pointless to carry on like this. So thank you very much. Good day. <laughs> and he managed to find some good licks in there, which he put on that record. Um, but the story with Whitney is, so I never met her. She was not in the studio when I was there. She'd already done her vocals. She sounded great. I mean, I could tell she was a great singer. But you never know which of the many things you do in a recording session, what's going to be the hit. I am, I've never been too good at predicting hits. <laughs> That's not been my strong suit. <laughs> I'll tell you a couple stories about that in a minute. So um, about three months after that session, the phone rings at my house. Hello? 
Uh, is this Tom Scott? Yes. Well, you don't know me, but uh, you played on my record a, a, a few months ago. Uh, my name is Whitney Houston. I said, oh, yeah, hi. Hi, yeah. Very nice. Well, it's, well, nice of you to call. She says, I just wanted to call you and let you know how much I appreciated what you contributed to my to my record. I said, well, thank you. How, how sweet of you to do that, you know? And, and and that was the end, basically the end of the conversation. But you know, not that I expect it ever, because I'm paid from I'm paid well for my services. People don't have to call and thank me. But just the fact that she, of all the people I've worked for, I, that I I, th I can't really remember. there maybe have been one or two more, but I don't remember it. She was the one that that took the time to get when she you know she got my number from I guess from Michael I don't know and took the time to pick up the phone and call me and tell me that and I, I thought that was very very sweet of her it spoke to her you know she her inner core was she was a kind uh, uh, thoughtful person you know yeah well wow. in that so. session that's very much the uh, other end of the spectrum from the Paul McCartney thing with the first take and <laughs> yes, it is. Yes. We just if ran only, the gamut right there. If only Paul McCartney had been the producer, I would have gotten out of there earlier. <laughs> For the same money, by the way. I wasn't being paid by the by the take. <laughs> oh my gosh. So yeah, so um I, I just treasure moments like that. It's like you know, the as I get older, I, I know a lot of great players, but the the players that I hire now are the ones who are A great players and B really cool people. <laughs> I can't, I'm done with any kind of diva uh, behavior, male or female, okay? I uh, just, I don't want it, I don't, I don't want it in my life. And and we we did a gig recently here in Ventura, uh, kind of near where I live, at a little club here called The Grape. And just had the best old time, and the music was fab, fantastic. And the guys are just all so nice. It's just a joy, it's a joy to d make music with nice people, you know? Well, I've seen some of those videos on YouTube of you uh, that are fairly recent. And you just, you can tell you're having such a good time and it doesn't matter what the environment is. I mean, no. it's just for the joy. And uh, it's so great to see that you're still doing that. Absolutely, man. Absolutely. You know? As long as I can still stand and play a, play an instrument, I'll be doing it. And I hope it's a long time. You know, I, uh, I'm, in, I'm, in, I'm in good health. I, I uh, you know, if I just try to, as, as, they all, as the old Max would go, because I, I too tend to, you know, get a gut going here. And, and of course, the key to that is eat less, move more. Is that so, right? I know. I tell it's not rocket science. <laughs> I, I have the same demon with that, Tom. Yeah. So. <laughs> so, I'm a, I go up and down. Uh, what, what was your take on, um, you know, when they came in through the, with the business of, you know, really pushing smooth, smooth jazz? I didn't like it. I, I, not, not in principle, but the music that was being labeled smooth jazz and many of the many of the um, proponents of of smooth jazz, particularly the saxophone players. Okay, first of all, it's a kind of a limited um, style, uh, rhythmically and and you know and chordally and stuff. It's 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 kind of very narrow band to me. Uh, uh, <laughs> I was just reminded of a uh, of a Kenny G joke <laughs> because look. As much as a saxophone players, I mean, I'm speaking for myself. I admired his success and everything. I was not enamored with his playing style. It, it seemed, and, and you know, pardon me for saying this, it seemed effeminate to me. Now, I don't mean that he sound like a girl playing, but the style is is kind of, I don't know. It doesn't have, you know, any fire in it. It's very, you know, like that, and. Uh, and but I, I, listen, he did. He's done incredibly well. Of course, investing in Starbucks at an early point d didn't hurt either. But in any case, th th so uh, there was one point, and this is quite a few years ago, where Kenny G. Apparently, this is true. He got divorced from the wife he'd been with. Okay, so I read a, a statement by I guess it was a comedian somewhere online or something. He said, "Yeah, bad news today. You know, Kenny Kenny G. got divorced, but um, elevators all over the country observed a moment of silence." <laughs> yeah so anyway so smooth jazz so um i i think it's just too repetitive and i think the saxophone i used to know saxophone players we discussed this earlier the great gamut from the, you know, the mellow the stan gets and the paul desmond and over here the colt trains and the sonny rollins and uh you know and the maceo parkers and uh king curtis's 
and anything in between. There was the, there's a very distinctive style each of these people. I can listen to s s smooth jazz saxophone players. I, ca I can't tell who anyone is. They all sound alike to me. And I hate to say that. I, I you know, I, I value originality. Go for something original and create a style of your own, man. Come on. <laughs> it's well, dull. It, it, it's it dull just, to me. It went so uh, far removed from the fusion and exploration of the yes, 70s. It did. To yes, what it happened, did. it had the balls taken off it into it, the It 80s. did, it did. It was just, yeah, that's right, just uh, castrated right there in front of our eyes. So I, I'm not a big fan of it. I, it's it's okay. You know, I can listen to it for a while. But as soon as I hear some saxophone player doing, you know, whatever whatever you call that, Kenny G. Lips, kind of a cloing. Like, yeah. yeah, yeah. I'm like, oh, no, get me a check, please. You know, I'm out of here. So I, I hate to say that. Well, Kenny G, the weird thing is that when he came up, the first couple of Jeff Lorber Fusion albums, I was digging. Oh, and that's when I first met him, actually. He came up to me in a club. I didn't know him, but he introduced himself. And uh, I said, I'm with Jeff Lorber. and said, oh, yeah, I've heard you. Yeah, man, you're really good. You know, and that was all I said to him. Uh, the, 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 the fame came much later. Yeah, no, he's a good he's a good saxophone player, but he just apparently has embraced this style for all time. And it's just, it's not my cup of tea, that's all. I, you know, I don't begrudge him, and uh, as I say, he's done, he's done far better financially than I will ever dream of. But that, but that doesn't matter. I, I'm doing what I love. I guess I hope he's doing what he loves, <laughs> and I'm, I'm making. I've made a very good living uh, doing what I love, so that's good. But I'm sure there were probably labels and things that tried to put you in that box. Probably, you know. I, I remember at one festival. This was probably 23 years ago, 20 years ago, I mean. Um, I remember being introduced, and this was, I think, in D.C., a stage at some festival in D.C., whoever the announcer was says, and now one of the founding fathers of smooth jazz, Tom Scott. And I was like, oh, really? Am I? Do I have to be? Can I? Can we, can we have someone else father it? Uh, would you mind? Anyway. Uh. But in a way, I suppose I did. I mean, I was part of that, you know, rhythm-based, you know, funk kind of thing, which just got, I don't know, as you say, kind of neutralized and homogenized too, too much for me. Well, I really feel like it was the record companies that were at the root of that, is my opinion. I, I, I don't know. I, I Listen, some of the guys that I know uh, who do it, who, who continue to put out smooth jazz records, they seem to enjoy it. They, they, they think it's great. And, and, you know, who am I to say? I'm just one guy with an opinion. Yeah. Got to keep it real, man. Um, what was it like for you doing the uh, Academy Awards? Oh, man, it was so fun. In fact, when you see a big audience, that was my biggest audience. Like It's like a billion people watch that thing live. And uh, what happened was um, Quincy Jones, my dear, dear friend, who has been so kind to me since I was about 19 years old, uh, he called me one day and said, I'm producing the Academy Awards, and I want you to lead the orchestra. And I said, I'd be so honored. And so I did. Uh, it, was the year, it was the year in 96, I think, the year that uh, Whoopi Goldberg was the host and Braveheart was the best picture. I forget the other awards, but if you remember Braveheart, that was the year that it won. And uh, I, uh, you know, I assembled the orchestra, handpicked them with Quincy's blessing, you know, I just thought of a great story I should tell you about the Academy Awards. So one of my functions as the music director was uh, 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 once they announced the winner, the uh, nominees in the best song category, my job then was to get the number of the manager or the artist themselves, mostly the manager of whoever had sung that song and get them on the phone and say, look, congratulations on being nominated. We, we want your client or you to appear on the Academy Awards on our broadcast. Um, we have to now figure out how to cut the uh, the song down to uh, two two minutes and, and fifty seconds, and I had to I had to be the bearer of that news because it's a three hour show and we got a lot going on and we can't you know make it as long as it was originally. So fine. So before I called anybody, I would I, I had a, a it seems a primitive by today's standards, but I had a computer that could uh, 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 playback audio files so I fed all the songs into my computer and then would edit the audio files and usually you know as most pop songs are they follow the A A B A fade form I mean that's pretty typical so 
in most of the cases I was able to edit either edit out something and, and shorten it to their satisfaction um, and I edited the tune that was by Brian Adams it was from a movie called Don Juan DeMarco which actually starred uh, I think Johnny Depp and Faye Dunaway and and uh, Marlon Brando if you remember that movie he had a he had a song called have you ever really loved a woman and it was kind of a Spanish vibe and it was like have you ever loved a woman? Da 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 loved a woman. Like, you know, that sort of thing with da 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 you know, in the background. Sort of a tango kind of vibe. And so, so I, ABA, I took the second verse out, shortened the fade, great. I sent it to them, and now I call the manager for the okay to go ahead and arrange it for our orchestra in that form. And he says, you know, did you receive the song? I said, oh, yes, we did. Can you, are you okay with it? Oh, no, we can't possibly do it that way. Why not? I should preface this by saying, by the way, that to, to those of us, and you, you're probably well aware of this, to, uh, the, the song Lush Life kind of epitomizes by Billy Strayhorn, epitomizes a, a real pinnacle of great, great songwriting in both lyrically and its form and the changes and everything. It's just elegant as hell. So that's like the the gold standard in songwriting. So, with that in mind, so uh, he says we can't do it. I say why not? Well, I say he says uh, because there's a line in that second verse that every woman in North America, in fact, around the world, just will have to hear. It has to be there. Okay, you want the second verse in? That's fine. What do you suggest we do to shorten it? He says take out the bridge. So I say. So what you're saying is you're going. We're going to do a a a fade. Yes, I say. Can you hold on a minute? And I put. The, I'm in the office of the Oscars. I, they gave me a, just a phone bank to make these calls. I put them on hold. I race across the hall. Quincy, Quincy, you got to hear this. I said, the Brian Adams guy. He wants to make the song, shorten it by going a a a fade. Quincy very calmly, as he always does, <laughs> calmly looked up to me and said. Well, Tom, it isn't Lush Life, is it? I said, no, it's not. Thank you. Back, yeah, back on the phone. Yeah, that'll be fine. <laughs> so we did the song A, 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 Fade. Now, you think that that would be weird, right? But we go to rehearse the tune the first time. And of course, now we've got, we've got like people in the, it's, it's, we're at the Shrine Auditorium and the curtain goes up for this song and I start to play it. And on this, on this, you know, they have a lot of sets for this tune. They had an entire, like, I don't know, Mexican rancho thing happening with two stories. I mean, they were painted on, but they, but it looked like a Mexican hacienda kind of thing. And they had they had flamenco dancers and guys pretending to play the Spanish guitar and women, you know, girls with castanets dancing. It was like this three ring circus of uh, Spanish, you know, entertainment. And as long and I realized, and we go to we the tune, and I realized as long as you hear have you ever have you ever loved a woman, as long as you got the hook in there, the bridge is irrelevant because nobody's really paying attention to the form of the tune. That was a, that was a good lesson for me. Like, don't think you know what will work in every you know every situation, even if you're convinced that form or something matters more than anything, because uh, it's just not true. It won't. It, it's not always true, and it certainly wasn't true in this case. Wow, that's a that's an interesting lesson to learn. How how far how far be uh, ahead of the broadcast was that now knowledge rehearsed? brought to you? Oh, it was like the, well, the broadcast was on a Sunday. This would have been like the Friday, the the first the first run through, total run through the show. Then we do a full dress rehearsal on Saturday. So you know, if there's any glitches or mistakes, I mean, there's 125 pieces of music on a stand for every musician in that orchestra. That's how much music there is in in a three hour award show, and that includes. You know, music you play in between when we're a commercial, coming, going to commercial, coming back from commercial, introducing, and now to present the next award here is so and so. There's a play on, and then of course there's the win. You know, we got for all the nominated category, nomination categories, we've got each nominated uh, theme uh, for each show on a, on two pages of uh, you know, on a two page part, we, in like marching band size. You know, like reduced way so this you can get five of them on a and usually it's just like eight bars or 12 bars with a turnaround so because it's just the only purpose is to to provide music while the the person who wins gets out of their seat walks down the aisle and gets up there and uh and, sa and says thank you very much and we cut the band so uh 
it's a it's a big job and i i tell you what i i will say this uh i will say this boastfully we were perfect there was not one glitch the only thing that happened was there was a documentary uh and and uh, that won and it was about the holocaust okay and so uh, an elderly lady came up uh, with with the guy who had the filmmaker and he started to talk and the lady was just standing behind him and we couldn't really see her uh she was back behind him so he talks and talks and talks and i get ready to play play off and i and i go like this and she starts to talk and 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 i hear the director say tom we should play him off and my arms just wouldn't go down and i realized this is a holocaust survivor the last thing i'm going to do is play her off you know she's earned or the right to make a speech at the end she had the you know she had the tattoo on her arm and everything it was like so oh my god it's heavy. You know? wow. <laughs> so if that was a glitch so be it i did it i'm proud of it <laughs> i don't consider that a glitch but i was just going to ask you about playing off people you know if that was awkward at all well sure it's awkward it's it's awkward and uh now this now i'm cutting to the emmys i i was music director for the emmys like nine times nine or ten times something like that and it all depends on who the producer is i was a favorite of the of the producers that were working on the show at that time so i i got calling and called many times in successive years this particular year uh there was a director he's no longer with us he was a man named walter miller and and you know a live being a director on a live television show is a real hard job because you know for three for three hours man you've got to be i mean you have a script and you have set things that are supposed to happen but then there's always those non unknown things that happen you know where you got to get a camera over here for something and the you know whatever it is so the routine for uh, starting an emmy show and and i i, I guess we did for the oscars too i don't remember um uh our director walter comes out to the audience about 10 minutes before air and says hey ladies and gentlemen welcome to the uh, uh, uh emmys um for those of you who are uh, nominated congratulations uh but for those for those one in five of nominees who actually wins please we we request sincerely that you keep your speeches as short as possible and if you don't if you go on too far our band leader, our orchestra leader up here, he points to me, will will get, start playing music that indicates it's time to stop, you know. And of course, if they don't stop, they'll just cut off the mic and, and go to go to commercial or something. I mean, they they don't, they can't put up with that, you know. So, <laughs> so Walter, it turns I found out I'd actually I'd worked with him before, so I knew this already by this particular show. Walter, when he starts out. When the, in other words, he says, they count down to the air. You know, we're going on the air like millions of people are watching. At five, four, three, two, one. And I start playing the music. And I hear, son of a bitch. You know, and I, I'm like, oh, God, have, have I, am I do, doing the wrong thing? Should I stop the music? That was the first time. And I, I, I kept playing because I felt I knew it had to be right. And I see credits coming on and I'm, you know, stuff that there should be music behind. <laughs> so I keep playing and I get to the end and I realize that he's just pumping himself up for this three hour focus that he's got to have in order to make this show go right. And I, 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 another thing is, I must say, I loved working with a show like that because the crew, the camera guys, the stage managers, the orchestra, of course, who are all my picks and my friends um we're all seasoned professionals it you know if, if something fucks up it will be it won't be that we that we didn't have the best people on the job just things happen from time to time but walter has of course i'm, I'm having a headset on and i hear everything walter says and actually there's a lot of can camera two two okay get set camera three and three a lot of that going on this jabber going on in my phones the whole time and and of course you, you have to train yourself to only listen to the things that matter to you for example when they say in camera three camera four and music <laughs> i gotta start playing something i gotta have something ready i you know because we have a script and i know what's coming so i, I just say okay this is coming soon i gotta wait for the cue i can i've got uh foot switches one i can talk to the director one i talk just to the orchestra and another one i can I, you know i got one of those headsets with the microphone here so i hear walter now the show's going very well no one's going over we don't have to give him the hook music get them off everybody's being fine and then we get a lady 
who I guess it was it was a category that most people in America don't really care about, like best makeup in a drama series, something like that, you know. And the winner is uh, Betsy Johnson for West Wing, whatever it was. I don't remember her name. Anyway, let's say it was that. So turns out the camera's like having trouble finding her because usually they they try to put the people they think might be winners, although they don't know for sure, in the in the middle, in the aisle seats so they can just get up. They don't have to walk through people, you know, to get to the aisle and then just straight up. And well, they didn't they didn't expect her to win, I guess, because she was in kind of the middle of a row. And the thing that she's the poor thing stands up. She's like 350, 400 pounds. She's huge. Now she has to step in, step around all the people sitting in the seats to get to the aisle, and I'm now I'm playing the West Wing theme, and I'm watching this on my monitor. I'm going, I better this is going to take a while. I better slow this down because it's gonna it's it's gonna be a long trip for her. And uh, so now she finally makes it to the aisle, and now she is walking slowly up the aisle, and now up the steps, and now she gets to the podium. Orchestra off. And she begins to thank everyone she's ever known. In fact, before, prenatally, she was thanking people prenatally. And she's thanking this, that, this, this kindergarten teacher I had who taught me how to, I don't know, put lipstick on. Who knows? It was some whatever it was. And my parents and my this and that and this friend and so on. And she's going on and on and on. Now, I can, uh, she's rapidly reaching the end of her her allowable, allowable time. I can hear Walter in my headset. He's like going, <laughs> God, 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 seething. God. yeah, seething. So I, so I go to the, I hit that uh, foot pedal that goes to the orchestra. And I say, ladies and gentlemen, I think you better get the hook music ready. <laughs> I think we're about to use it. See, they, they have it at the back of their book so they can always grab it, you know, in, in an emergency. So we're, now we're ready with the hook music. And Walter's going, and she and she's thanking this person and that person, and Walter goes, "Why don't you thank McDonald's, you fat fuck? Play her off, <laughs> okay?" Da, 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 da. Now, that's very unkind to a to a person who was overweight, but in his mind, she had it coming because he screwed up. He she's screwing up his show. <laughs> so, and of course, the only people who could hear it are me, all the cameramen, the stage managers, all of us. We're like. <laughs> Wow. Oh Lord, that's a great story. It, it was so fun. Much. And I, I listen, and I, I love. As I say, I love the thing we did. We've done the show twice before it goes on the air. So <clears throat> basically, it's a it's a recitation of stuff we already know. So it's not difficult. It's just you've got to stay focused. You know, don't lose your don't lose your focus, and uh, and everything will be fine. Wow, it's quite an accomplishment pulling something like that off. Is, is there anything aside from award shows uh, that you would say? Um, was your most complex project and that sure you... well yeah writing a film score uh definitely the first the first score of any consequence that i wrote was the fourth uh sorry the fifth of the six planet of the apes movies uh the original ones with the first one had charlton heston in it the ones back from the 70s or the 60s i guess was the first one so it was 1972 i guess 71 or two and the f first four movies were all, you know, relative successes, although the budget's probably, and the and the box office is probably less than the first one, but still profitable, right? Gave so Roddy McDowell a, a career, something to do. Rod Roddy McDowell was, that's right, <laughs> he was in he, he was in all of them, that I, yeah. as far as I knew, because he was, he played the talking ape from the original, who came, see, okay, I, I'm going to set this up. <laughs> For those of you who haven't seen the, the Planet of the Apes series, it starts out, where uh, some astronauts land on an unknown planet and they don't know where they where they are, what's happening. Uh, and it turns out that apes run the planet and into to the apes, these are wild animals who should be caged. And finally they escape um, and they are, uh, she, and he, he makes a girl, he, he meets a girl and they become, she can't speak English of course because she's like just makes sounds, but she's beautiful and they become a couple and they escape on some horseback and they're riding down the beach at the end of the movie and then he comes across the stat the head and the arm and the, and the crown of the Statue of Liberty and he suddenly realizes, oh my gosh, I'm on earth, who knows how many hundreds of years, thousands of years in the future. So the rest of the backstory is how we got to that point how apes took over the planet earth because that's that's what happened obviously at some point so um 
so the fifth one, which is the one I did, see, Jerry Goldsmith did the first, a great, a brilliant score on that first one. A guy named Leonard Rosenman, a very, very excellent kind of avant-garde composer, did the second. Goldsmith did the third. Rosenman did the fourth. Now we're getting down to the, like, the, the you know, the low budget, lower budget guys like myself. Because I was, what was I, 23, 24? I was just, but I, I was kind of, I was getting, I was doing some television composing over there at Fox. And, uh, and, and Lionel Newman, the head of the department, liked me. God, he was great. What a fun guy, God. Anyway, um, so I, I do this movie and I see it. And this, and this represents where the apes actually revolt against the humans who are, who are subjugating them. And take, this is the, the fifth one is where they actually take over the earth. In a, in a in a giant rebellion so the last 50 to 20 minutes was a was a just a giant battle scene is that, is that a battle the, for the planet of the apes no conquest conquest, conquest of the planet of the yeah conquest and uh so um uh, i i watched the movie uh, to find out where we should put music and i thought you know i need an instrument that because they're it, it, we see them being trained and, and and people are trying to train them no you pick up the coffee cup they're, they're i mean there was clearly there was an analogy with slavery to this thing because they're they're actually making the apes slaves and do, do all the menial jobs for humans uh and, and so they're clumsy and they're trying to get it right and is so i said i need i thought i needed an instrument I actually built an instrument that i thought would be among the other we had a big big orchestra no strings but f four trumpets four french horns four trombones a tuba ten woodwinds a huge percussion section and a prepared piano you know what a prepared piano is where you put nuts and bolts and screws in a in a piano so it just goes doop, 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 you know it's random kind of it, it becomes a random percussion instrument really so but i built a daca de bello now daca de bello is like a kind of a marimba but it doesn't have fixed pitches and so I, I made a big one because I, I saw these big apes as being clumsy. So one that goes boom, 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 would be appropriate. So I actually did bought a piece of ebony. I, I don't even think you can buy ebony anymore. It's so rare. Um, and made cross cuts, build a wooden box underneath it, um, you know, sounding sounding board underneath, and then made these cross cuts and uh, these uh, parallel cuts all the way across and then single cuts in each of these bars so they would just again be random pitches one on each side of the cut so you know boom bing, 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 boom 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 like that and i i, I corporate that gave that to one of the percussion guys i said yeah you'll be, you'll be playing this sometimes and and our, the main title uh i i use an odd time signature once again i thought the awkwardness of the apes was would be appropriate to have it not in something steady so it was a 13 8 uh tempo like divided three, 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 two, two. All right. One, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, one, two, you know, like that. So uh, it was kind of unconventional in that way. And that was a challenge. But of course, a challenge that I just, I couldn't wait to get up in the morning and get back to that project, man, and figure out how to, you know, make good music and i'm proud to say that 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 uh that score ended up on a cd with one of the other planet of the apes i guess the last one so we're, we're on a we're on a, a dual cd of, of both those pictures uh, planet of the planet of the apes five and six how long did that project take you oh man for at least three months maybe you know maybe more three or four months probably three did months you, have, did you communicate at all with the director uh, I, I, I didn't. Um, you know, in those days, uh, of course, Lionel Newman, who was the head of the music department there, comes from a long line of Newmans. His, his brother, the doctor, is the father of Randy Newman. Uh, his brother, Abel Newman, was the music director at Goldwyn Studios. And um, the Newmans are just like, you know, Hollywood royalty. And, and directors didn't want to mess with him, mess with him. <laughs> because he actually was known, if he didn't like what a director was saying to a composer, he would throw him off the scorings, off the orchestra stage. Get out of here. We, we got this covered. We'll give you the music, okay, when we're ready. <laughs> now, you can't do that anymore because the director is the auteur. And, you know, I mean, look, it was an old, it was a system, the studio system produced a lot of good things. It was, it had its 
you know, it had its uh, negative sides, but but I loved it. I loved it, and and I think I mean I did talk to the director a little bit, but I don't think he cared. I I, I got the feeling it was an older gentleman, a British guy. I can't think of his name, and he didn't seem to be too concerned. I think he was just doing it for the money. <laughs> So uh, I took over and with Lionel, I'd ask, I consulted Lionel on a few things, but but I knew what I kind of knew what I had to do. I mean, I uh, I've got to paint this picture of these primitive and their and their rise to power, and then then the and then I did a real um, uh, like the battle scene. I used a lot of um, unconventional sounds. Where it's I learned this from Lala Schifrin, by the way, mm-hmm. where you you have a series of ten to twelve second. Ep- um, what do you call them? Episodes. Uh, like the first one might be all the woodwinds playing their hot, or maybe just clicking their 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 keys. Just ten guys clicking keys into the microphone. So you get this. I mean, it's all like sound effects, really. And then you have the oh, the low brass playing, just playing staccato, the lowest note they can find. So it sounds like a bunch of angry giant bumblebees. And, you know, like do an effect thing because the, the apes are battling. There's, you know, guns and bombs and noise and everything. So I'm not going to write, you know, a symphony in there. It's, it'll be buried. So I'll just play it like that. The funny thing is, um, I, and then the last three minutes or so, I went into a more conventional score, you know, you know, big that, big, big climax and everything. So we did this cue, which is about, as I say, about 12 minutes long, most of which was these kind of sound effects. And then the big finish, this is the very first rehearsal, and I'm going, I'm thinking, oh, this is great. And Lionel Newman sitting right here, the guy I'm telling you about, and he says, you got that from Lalo Shitcan, didn't you? <laughs> busted he didn't mind that i'd done it that got it from him but he he knew right away where that technique had come from <laughs> hey he was a master for sure <laughs> oh yeah oh yeah i did a lot of dates with lalo and it was always in education uh, he had some very unique ideas about film scoring and great and he was of course he was dizzy's pianist you know dizzy he came to this country as dizzy gillespie's piano player so he had serious jazz roots and that, that was always nice did you get into a theater when it was running and actually see it with an audience and hear your score to be honest with you i don't remember i don't remember i know it just came i just taped it recently because it was on uh, turner classic movies so i taped it <laughs> and it sounded pretty good too what i heard i haven't heard it all yet but it sounded pretty good it was a long time ago man what was that 55 years ago something like that 60 yeah. years i don't know could you identify, uh, say, three uh, records that you're most proud of? Of my own, of yeah. my record, yeah, my records. Yeah. Well, you know, I mean, those that period in there, uh, 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 Tom Scott and the LA Express, Tom Cat, New York Connection, and Blow It Out. Those, 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 those four are, were really a pinnacle in my in my life and my career. I did another record, which I'm very proud of, called Intimate Strangers, uh, which was the first time I ever tried to do one side of, a, of an LP that was kind of all tied together. Um, a, th- a theme, you know, I had a theme. And the theme was, uh, surprisingly, I shall, you'll be shocked to hear this, a guy who's on the road as a musician, and he meets a girl, and they have a love affair for a while, and then, then he's got to go. So it's a bunch of movements. And included in that... Um, Jaco Pastorius, who had become a dear friend of mine, walked into the studio one day and he said, have you got anything for me to play on? I says, well, give me about a half an hour and I will. <laughs> so so he contributed a beautiful, beautiful, um, gorgeous solo of this love theme uh, as part of this as part of this suite. And uh, I, I, I love Jaco dearly and he was he had his problems later on. But at, at that time, at that time, he hadn't, you know, just his, his brain was still you know, functioning well. And, uh, and he was fun. He was athletic. We laughed a lot. We went to the beach a couple of times and, and threw Frisbees and stuff. It, it was, it was, it was great. Hmm. So that, there was that, that was really special. So those four, but those first four, they, I mean, that, that LA Express through the blow it out, those, those albums. And the other thing about it is I had, you know, I could, I had pretty much unlimited budgets. I could do what I wanted with every tune. So you can hear it on the record. There's, 
It, it all went on the record. You know, there's there's a huge couple of tunes, Shadows uh, on uh, Blow It Out has a huge string section, you know, which for which I wrote the arrangements. And and uh, Lou was like, Lou Adler was like, yeah, man, whatever it costs. Just do what you do. What you do. And that, that was great. It's, it's a whole different scene now. Yeah, well, I felt pretty good then where I came into your uh, history, you know, right at the peak. Um, you got it. Billie Jean. Yes. Yeah. Uh, how did you? What about it? No. <laughs> how did how did that happen? <laughs> and, and did you did you uh, have any interaction with uh, Michael Jackson or uh, uh, a, a handshake? And, and he was in his military outfit uh, at the studio. You know, very pl hi. How are you? A very light handshake, like one of those where it's like, I was afraid if I went, I might blow him away. A very um, air. He's an air son kind of guy. You know what I mean? Uh, uh, when he's on a stage, of course, things change radically. But in you know, in real life, I, he was this very mild-mannered kind of guy. Uh, that's all I got from him. And then he vanished. I never saw him again. Then I went in the studio. Quincy had called me, Quincy Jones, to uh, to add some, uh, as they say, air candy to Billy Jean. And there were a few things on the on the original demo of Billy Jean that uh, that uh, that hadn't been added yet. And I had the that electronic instrument that I played back then, a wind synthesizer called the Lyricon, and I added those few little spots. I've got a I've got a TikTok uh, that that shows exactly what I played on uh, on Billie Jean. Oh, we didn't mention the TikTok. I've got a TikTok. I think I'm an in, a TikTok influencer now, whatever the hell that means. <laughs> uh, but I've done about, geez, I don't know, maybe fifty of them, sixty of them. Uh, kind of in pairs where I play the thing like Billy Jean, the thing for Billy Jean, and then I talk about what it was like uh, being in the studio playing at Billy Jean. And I've got all those with all the ones we talked about: Paul McCartney, Carol, Joni, Steely Dan, and on and on like that. You mentioned about not being so good at, at picking hits. So uh, when you heard something like Billy Jean, that's like an all-time hit. I mean, did you think, oh, this is a hit? I wasn't thinking about it much at that point because all I wanted to do was I wanted to please Quincy. Whatever he wanted, that's what I wanted to do. That was my focus. Is it a hit? It sounds cool. It sounds really cool. But I never know. As I say, will it be, will it how will people feel about it? I Listen, I, I knew Walter Becker from Steely Dan. He was, a, he was a really, really nice guy and remained a dear friend of mine for some years after we worked together on Asia and Gaucho. <clears throat> and... Uh, he, we had a mutual friend, and one day he brought, I was at the friend's, and he brought over a test pressing of Asia. And he put it on, and I listened to it, and I thought, man, this this thing is really, really super cool. I mean, it's what a what a cool, different kind of pop record. But for that very reason, I thought, it's just probably not going to sell much, because it's just too esoteric. Of course, the thing went on the charts and wouldn't leave for months and months and months. So again, I was wrong. One thing I do remember hearing, I was a friend of George Harrison's for about, the, very close for about three three years. Um, and I worked on three of his solo albums during that period, which was 75, six, seven, right in there. He had a friend, Gary Wright, the keyboard player. And Gary Wright came over one night when I was there and put on a little thing called uh, Dreamweaver. And I listened to that and I thought, now that is a hit. As far as I could concerned, that's got to be a hit. <laughs> and I was right. I got that one right. <laughs> yeah, by far his biggest hit. Um, well, so as we wrap this up, Tom, you know, you're you're doing so many things. I want to make sure you get to plug whatever you'd like to plug. Well, so could you tell everybody how they sure. can keep up with you? Sure. Okay, so my, uh, my disc jockey uh, thing is uh, every Tuesday night at 9 p.m. Uh, Pacific, on on K K Jazz K J A Z Z, there's a K J Z Z in Tucson, which is not us. We're the ones in in California, in Long Beach, California. Um, K J K Jazz. If you just Google that, you can stream it. Or also, they have some of my episodes along with others um, in their in their library, so you can listen to them. Uh, you know, at, at the hour of your choice. Um, as I say, I've got I've got a podcast Tom Scott's Podcast Express, a little little you know little play on L A Express. Um, and I've done uh, over 50. Uh, we, we don't have them all out yet. They're still still being edited, but I've done about 50 of them. Uh, next week, uh, actually this week, I'm doing um, uh, H.R. McMaster, the, who was the, who was the uh, National Security Advisor to our last president for a year, and he's oh. a fabulous guy. I mean, I, I met him through some friends. He is just so cool and, and really into the funk, by the way. He's a real funkmeister, uh, which I will get into in this podcast. 
and I'm doing um, uh, Douglas Brinkley, the, the historian, presidential historian. I've, obviously, I've done a lot of musicians, you know, Christian McBride and Keb Moe and Steve Gadd and Vinnie Colaiuta and, you know, drummers. And I did a saxophone one with Dave Cause and, uh, and this girl, um, uh, Grace Kelly and... Uh, 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 Shame on me. Anyway, I've, I've done a lot of them. So that's Tom Scott's Podcast Express, wherever you get your podcasts. Just put the, type that in and you'll see it. It's also on my website, tomscottmusic.com, if you want to go there. Um, and then the other thing, of course, is this TikTok thing I was talking about. If you have a TikTok app, I thought it was just for kids. And my social media guy who's in Connecticut suggested that I do a TikTok explaining some of the solos I've done for various people and talking about it. And, and it's turned, I have 21,000 followers and 106,000 likes. So obviously there are people out there who appreciate this information. And older people, a lot of mostly older people, some younger, but but you know, people who remember when the when these records came out and what that meant to them and it's very it's just very gratifying to know that you know, people want to know this stuff and they they still value the music. So that's it, the podcast, the uh the radio show, the Twitter. I'm on Instagram too at Tom Scott Jazzman as well. They're both at Tom Scott Jazzman, both Instagram and Twitter. So th there's 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 a nauseating information amount of information about me on those all of those platforms. <clears throat> what, what what inspired you to you know reach out to the public so much like that? Well, uh, it was part of it was COVID. <laughs> I found myself in my room. What am I going to do? You know. And, and as I say, I am I'm very close with the guy who was the head of jazz at, uh, at the Steinhardt School at NYU, New York University. A great guy, Dr. Dave Schroeder, saxophone player. He came to interview me about six, seven years ago because uh, he has a whole interview series he was doing. And we found that we were like two peas in a pod, man. Even though he's younger than me, but the, all our favorite albums, it's like the same list. <laughs> so he's been a dear friend, and he turned me on to his buddy, who's a who also is a is a pure jazzer. I mean, of the highest order. Uh, he he actually programs my radio show most of it because uh, he knows stuff, uh, you know, stuff that's out this year and stuff going back to you know the 30s or 40s. So um, uh, he's he's the guy. He was my guru as far as getting into social media, and once it was suggested, Dave said, "You got to do a podcast." Okay. <laughs> <laughs> you know, you know some people. Yeah, I know some people. I'll call them. And it worked out really well. I, it turns out I really love doing the research when I'm talking to people. I want to know their story. You know, not what they're doing right now because that, that, that'll that go away in time. I want these things to be more timeless. So I, I, I want to know about their childhood. I always ask, no matter what their field, I always ask, do they what music were they into? Because that's always interesting. And then the thing that at some point something happened to them, either a person or an event or something where they thought to themselves, you know what, I'd like to, maybe I could take a stab at this, this, this field, this field that they end up going into and being incredibly successful. And the real interesting part, of course, is the, that bridge where, how, where you get from that point, I'd like to do this to actually being a success at it. That Those stories are fantastic and timeless. And I want everybody to know that there's nobody who just walked into the scene, music scene or show business scene, and said, here I am. For everybody who is who is successful, there has been some kind of a struggle to get there and hard work and rejection. And, you know, what's that old rock song? I get knocked down. I get up again. You know, you got to do that. You got to do that, and, you, and I want people to know that they can realize their dreams if they're willing to fight for them, like these mm -hmm. people did. Yeah, you got to be resilient. And I was yeah. very impressed seeing the you know spectrum of guests that you have on your podcast. Yeah, and you have a good voice for it too. So, well, I, I've always been told I have a good radio voice. And now the blues. I'm sorry, the news. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and you know, looking on YouTube, another social vehicle for you. Um, I was just going through some of your stuff, and I saw that uh, Shimaria big band. Oh, Rich Shimaria big band in New York. Shimaria, yeah, yeah that yeah, was yeah. really enjoyable. Great, great. Glad you like it. Yeah, we recorded that live at uh, at NYU a few years back before COVID when I was there. Yes, indeed. Yeah. So, keep trying to keep busy, you know. Yeah, well, I'm so glad. You know, thank you so much for all this My time pleasure. and for your stories. Sure. And oh, man, thank you so much for all the great music, Tom. It's my pleasure. Thank you. Enjoy so, it. I enjoyed our talk. Thank you. I hope you enjoyed this episode of Truth and Rhythm. A big thank you goes out to our guest as well as to you, the viewer and listener. 
Also, much gratitude to Pleasure for supplying the show's funky opening and closing music. As a reminder, you can always access the complete list of linked shows by episode at funkinstuff.net. I urge you to support this program and receive the extra benefits along with that by subscribing to the Funk and Stuff channel on YouTube and sharing it with funk, R&B, and jazz lovers, joining Truth and Rhythm's membership program at Patreon, submitting a donation at funkinstuff.net, buying Everything is on the One, the first guide to funk book at Amazon, shopping at the Funky Things store for cool merchandise at funkinstuff.net, and linking through funkinstuff.net for all of your Amazon purchases. In addition, if you're an artist or anyone seeking proven, results-oriented, professional marketing, PR, writing, or editing consultation or production, check out the Media Services section at funkinstuff.net. Also, I encourage you to drop me a line at scottg at funkinstuff.net. I love the feedback, suggestions, guest requests, appearance and sponsorship inquiries, and just talking about my favorite subject, groove-based music. For now, and as always, this is Scott Dr. GX Goldfine saying, keep on keep vibing on to the rhythm of the one.